Just before we begin here in John chapter 15, verse 12, we need to set the scene very squarely in our mind. Jesus is there in the upper room with 11 of his disciples, not 12, because Judas has already left the room. Judas has left the room because he is on his way to tell the chief priests and the religious leaders where they can find Jesus. He'll be in the Garden of Gethsemane within the hour, and there they can find him and arrest him and begin the chain of events that will take Jesus to the cross. Now, Jesus knows all this. In those days, of course, they didn't have a clock on the wall, but if they did have a clock on the wall in the upper room, Jesus would glance up at that clock and he'd say, within an hour, I'm going to be arrested. He'd calculate within, I don't know, 13, 14, 15 hours, whatever, I'm going to be on a cross. Jesus knew it. He understood it. And therefore, there was a sense of urgency within Jesus. An urgency that when it's a few hours before you're going to be arrested, when it's a few hours before you're going to be on the cross, you don't mess around with trivial things. If you're going to pour out your heart to your disciples, you're going to do it about the things that matter the very most. And so Jesus was trying to prepare them for what life would be like without him. He had spent almost every minute of the day with his disciples in the previous three years. And now he was going to leave them. He was going to leave them by going to the cross. And even after he rose from the dead, he was going to ascend to heaven. So he's preparing them for his departure. And as Jesus prepares them for his departure, we've seen in chapter 15, one of the first things he wanted to do was to urge them for them to continue his relationship with them. In other words, just because Jesus left them, it didn't mean that the relationship ended. No, as a matter of fact, it was going to begin in a new and different way. They would still abide in him and he in them. That's what we talked about last week. The relationship was going to go on. But now, starting at verse 12, Jesus says, it's not only important to me that you and I continue in relationship, he says to his disciples. He cared about how they related to one another. Look at it here in verse 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. Friends, would you please look with me at verse 12 and see those important words that you love one another as I have loved you. When Jesus spoke these words to his disciples in the upper room, it was so heavy on his heart that those disciples love one another. Friends, think about it in the previous three years. What it held... That diverse group of disciples together, these were men who came from different backgrounds, different different, uh, geography sometimes. Most of them came from Galilee, but some of them from Judea. Different economic classes. These were different men, and they always seemed to be arguing amongst themselves. What held them together? Jesus. Jesus, in their presence, held them together. Now he's leaving. Wouldn't it be logical if the disciples just disbanded after Jesus ascended into heaven? All right, guys. The one thing that held us together is now gone. I guess that's it. See ya. That's almost how it should have happened. But Jesus said, no, don't let that happen. It is so important to me that you guys stick together and love one another. I find it very interesting that when Jesus sent the disciples out before... You could look it up in Matthew chapter 10. When he sent the disciples out before, he gave them very detailed instructions. You know, go into a city, do this, don't take that. He gave them a list of four, five, six different instructions to take. Here, there's only one instruction. Love one another. That's it. Guys, I poured into you enough. Now the only thing that you have to remember is to love one another. But not only that, look at what he says. Love one another as I am have loved you. Now sometimes, I'm not saying it's accurate, but I'm just trying to be honest with you. Sometimes I think, hey, you know, I do a pretty good job loving other people in the family of God. Yeah, I'm full of love. I love everybody. That's great. Sometimes I think I do a pretty good job. And then I read those words, as I have loved you. 
Do I love other people the way Jesus loves me? And I say, oh, Lord, I need you to do that work in my heart. Jesus, would you make me that kind of person full of love? Not just full of the best kind of love that I can conjure up in my own heart. Jesus, I need you to fill me with your love. For me to love you the way Jesus loves me, that's big. So, Jesus, I need to be filled with your love and with your presence to do it. Now, these words made an incredible impression on the Apostle John, the author of this gospel. Ancient writings tell us that in John's very old age, when he was so infirmed that they had to carry him from place to place, could you imagine that the pastor being carried in on a stretcher so he could come up and preach the message? Uh, pastor Nate would be saying, and let's bring up Pastor David. And literally, people would be bringing me up here. John, when he was that old and infirm, when he was pouring out his heart to his disciples, they'd say, tell us, John, what's important? And he would say this. He would say, love one another. That's what he would say. Now, his disciples got kind of annoyed with this. It's like, John, you're always saying, blah, 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 love one another, love one another. Why do you keep telling us the same thing? And John would reply two reasons. He would say, number one, it is the Lord's commandment. This is what God commanded us. I mean, after all, look at what it says there in verse 12. This is my commandment that you love one another. It's the commandment of God. This isn't an option. If you have a brother or sister in the family of God that you're not right with, God's commandment to you is that you love them. This is his commandment. It's not a suggestion. Now, I know we feel weak. I know we feel unable to say, Lord, I can't do it. Then get on your face before Jesus and plead with him for the strength and say, Jesus, you command me to do this. Would you please work in me and through me to do it? When, when his disciples would say, John, why do you keep telling us the same thing over and over again? He would say, number one, it's the Lord's commandment. And number two, it alone is enough. You know, how much other things get settled in right order among us if we love one another? Love one another and everything seems to fall into place. Love one another as Jesus has loved us. Everything falls into place. So this made a very deep impression on John. But Jesus went on, verse 13. He says, greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. Listen, Jesus says, I'm going to demonstrate such a great love for you that I will lay down my life for you. I'm going before you. I'm going to set the example. And then he says very powerfully and beautiful in verse 15. He says, I have called you friends. Jesus described the measure and the quality of his love for them. It was a love that treated them not as servants, but as friends. Isn't it fascinating that so often when the great men of the New Testament introduce themselves to us, they introduce themselves to us as servants of God. Paul, servant of God. Peter, servant of God. That's just how they see themselves. Uh, James, a bond slave of Jesus Christ. Servant, servant, servant. That's how they see themselves. Jesus says, that's fine if you want to consider yourself my servant. I want you to know how I look at you. I look at you as my friend. Now, what's the difference? You know, in the ancient world, they had a lot of servants. And a servant could get a job done, but you would never think of a servant as your equal. A servant would never be a partner in getting something done. A servant was just like a tool with skin on it. Now, friends, please understand this. When Jesus brings us into his work, it's not just so that we can be his tool. It's so that we can be his friends, his partners within the work. You could remember it this way. More than workers, Jesus is looking for partners partners and he's looking for friends. Do, do you ever feel, because sometimes we talk about the work we should be doing for the Lord, and friends, there are things we need to do in serving God, but, but if you ever get the feeling, okay, I guess God just needs workers for his kingdom, he just needs a tool in his hand, and friend, it's a glorious thing to be a tool in God's hand, but he doesn't want you just to be a tool in that sense, he wants you to be his partner, his friend, he wants you to know what's going on, he wants to share life with you. You only do this if you love somebody. You only do this if you care about them. And this is the greatness of Jesus' love for us. Verse 16. You did not choose me, 
But I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. These things I command you, that you love one another. Very interesting, Jesus starts out in verse 16. He says, you did not choose me, but I chose you. Now, he just spoke of great privilege for the disciples, privilege of abiding in him, privilege of a close relationship, privilege of being called the friend of God himself. And in the midst of all that privilege, Jesus says, I don't want you to think that you earned this some way. I chose you. All right, here's the news, as plain as I can make it. The good news is God loves you more than you could ever imagine. But the little bit of twist on that news, I'm not going to say it's bad news, it's just a fact. He doesn't love you because you're so wonderful. He loves you because he's so wonderful. Can you just receive that? Amen. Instead of thinking, oh, I must be so wonderful that such a great God loves me. No, he does love you. <laughs> but the source of the love is in himself. It's not in you. You did not choose me, but I chose you. You know, in that day, it was normally the disciple who chose his master or rabbi. Jesus said, I know that you think it worked like that, but it didn't work like that. I chose you. And, verse 16, I appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. I didn't just choose you so you could have a title, a name, but that's so you could bear fruit, that you could live a life that brings glory to me. That's why I chose you, to go out and bear fruit and that you have answered prayer. Look at verse 16, that whatever you ask for the Father in my name, he may give you. This is another aspect of this close relationship with Jesus. We have answered prayer. And then verse 17, he repeats it again, that you love one another. Do you get the feeling this was important to Jesus? Repetition denotes importance, doesn't it? And so we need to love one another. This is what Jesus commanded us to do. Now verse 18, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. So in chapter 15, beginning at verse one, Jesus says, after I depart, this is how you and I are going to relate to each other. Then starting at verse 12, he says, after I depart, this is how I want you to relate to one another. I want you to love one another. Now starting at verse 18, Jesus says, after I depart, this is how you are going to relate to the world around you. And Jesus lays out some very sobering news. The world may very well hate you. Look at what he says right there in verse 18. 18, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Jesus warned his disciples that the world would often hate them. And as wonderful as Jesus is, and can we agree that Jesus is wonderful? You will not find many people who look at the life of Jesus and say, what a terrible man. I suppose there's a few nutcases out there. But, but even atheists and pagans, even if they don't believe it, they'll say, what a wonderful story. If such a man actually existed, it would be a wonderful thing. And so it's a little hard for us to understand. If Jesus is so wonderful, and if life in him is so wonderful, and if the message is so wonderful, why would it be rejected by the world? Why would the world often be hostile to it? But Jesus reminded them, men, they opposed me when I was in the world. They're going to continue to oppose you. You know, one of the things that we looked at at the Gospel of John as we made our way through it, we've seen that many times we're just sort of struck at the way that people reject Jesus. Why do they reject him? There he is right in front of them. Jesus says, that rejection is going to carry on even after I depart. You see, the disciples that Jesus spoke to that night, the 11 men in the room, they would know the hatred of the world. All of them were persecuted. 
And all of them died martyrs' deaths for Jesus. When he said, the world is going to hate you, yeah, it was going to kill you all. Well, no, I take it back. There was one exception. If the early church histories are reliable, then the apostle John was not martyred. He died a natural death, but it wasn't for a lack of trying. They tried to martyr him, but he wouldn't die. Some people say these are legend stories. We don't really know. But, but the information that we have is that they tried to kill the Apostle John, for example, as immersing him in like some hot oil or something. And it was like a spa treatment to him. He came out just fine. <laughs> but think about it. When Jesus looked in the eyes of the 11 men in the room, he knew they would endure hatred. But the early Christians, again, they understood the hatred of the world. Ancient writers... This is what they said about Christians. Ancient pagan writers looked at Christians and they called them haters of humanity. They looked at Christians and they called them guilty of terrible crimes and evil superstitions. Now, friends, I want you to understand that wasn't true. The early Christians were not haters of humanity. They loved humanity. Do you know how early Christians loved humanity? In the Roman world at that time, it was very common that when a child was born and if it was unwanted, what they would do is they, ha they had a formal term for it. You would expose the infant. You would usually go out to a special hilltop or place near your city and you would just simply leave the baby there to die. This was, this was commonly done in the ancient world. And they did it pretty much without conscience as much as it might tear the heart of a mother to know that she did such a thing. You know what early Christians did? They would sort of camp out near those places, and when people left their babies, they would rescue them and raise them, raise them as their own. Isn't that beautiful? Do you know why Christians were called haters of humanity? Because they wouldn't run along to the same parties and orgies and excesses that the rest of them did. Well, if you don't want to go to my drunken party, you must be a hater of humanity. No, I love you. I care about you. I just don't run that way anymore. They were called these things in the ancient world. And friends, Christians through the centuries have known the hatred of the world and millions have died for Jesus. Matter of fact, it is said that more Christians have died for Jesus in the 20th century from 1900 to 2000. It is said that more Christians have died for Jesus in the 20th century than in all previous centuries combined. The age of martyrs is not over. It is present in our own day and age. But, but this is what we take comfort of. Verse 18, he says, you know that it hated me before it hated you. You see, Jesus attracted attention from the multitudes. He attracted devotion from some individuals. Yet as a whole, the world hated Jesus and couldn't wait to put him on a cross. That was the reception that Jesus received from the world that he himself created. Now, we would think that when you rise from the dead and pronounce your love over the world, that that would fix that. They say, oh, well, I used to hate Jesus, but look at how he died on the cross. Look at how he rose from the dead. No, now I love him, but that's not how it worked. The resurrection itself wasn't enough to change the mind of the world. Friends. Why is it that the world oftentimes, not all the time, I don't want to exaggerate this at all, but why is it often that the world hates Christians? Well, sometimes they hate us just because we're different, just because we don't live the same way. I read in a commentary this week the story about a man named Jonas Harway. Jonas Harway was the man who invented the umbrella. Somebody had to invent the umbrella. Jonas Harway was the guy who did it. And as you might imagine, he was an Englishman. Rains a lot in England, so he invented the umbrella. It is said that when Jonas Hardway invented the umbrella and when he first used to walk down the street with an umbrella, people threw rocks and mud and, and just disgusting things at him, and they hated him. Why? Just because he was different. They thought it must What a weird thing that a man's walking down the street with a little umbrella over his head. Sometimes people hate you just because you're different. They don't need another reason than that. Sometimes, though, let's face it, we need to be honest about this. 
Sometimes Christians are hated because they're rude, because they're jerks. I'll say it, I'll probably say it three or four times in this message, but just so you get the, the loud and clear. It's an honor to be rejected for the sake of Jesus Christ. It's a shame to be rejected because you were a rude jerk, even if you did it in the name of Jesus. But the bottom line is that we will be hated if we are like Jesus. Not by everybody, not by any means, but certainly by some. It's kind of like this. The world is fine if you have just a little bit of Jesus in your life. You know, just a little sprinkling of Jesus over the top. The world's fine with that. But when Jesus is lifted up as Lord in your life, it'll disturb some people around you. You have to be ready to deal with that. And this is exactly what Jesus was trying to do, to warn his disciples. He told them, verse 19, because you are not of the world, that's why this persecution is going to come. Listen, you're not of the world, but he says, I chose you out of the world. The world may hate you, but I chose you. But remember this, verse 20, if they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Verse 21, but all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would have no sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they have seen and also hated both me and my father. But this happened that the word might be fulfilled, which is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. Why does the world hate Jesus? Because they don't know the father in heaven who sent them. That's what he says in verse 21. If people don't know God as he really is, they often attack and persecute those people who do display who God really is. And friends, if you display who God really is, many people will love it. But there will be some people, especially those who reject God very strongly and are running away from him, they will not like it at all. But Jesus said because he displayed who God was in both what he said and in what he did, verse 22, now they have no excuse for their sin. Because Jesus did come and speak to the world, they knew something of God that they did not know before, and this made them without excuse for hating and rejecting Jesus and his Father in heaven. Friends, do you understand what this means in verse 22? It means that the people of Jesus' day had a greater responsibility, they had a greater accountability because they had greater revelation. If you have a greater revelation from God, don't you have a greater responsibility? Now, in one sense, I feel sorry for you. I feel sorry for you if you hear the word of God faithfully week after week. Aren't you building up a pretty big level of accountability? Isn't God going to be able to say to you, what do you mean you never heard? You heard it every week. Now, that, that's not to have anybody leave. But just to realize, God, i got to do something with this heavier accountability. That principle remains. But notice, as friends, verse 25, Jesus says, They hated me without a cause. There was no just cause for the world to hate Jesus and his Father as they did. As the disciples of Jesus, as we, as we should expect some measure of rejection, some measure of persecution from the world, Friends, it should always be for just the same reason. It should be that it was without a cause in us. Let me say it again. It's an honor to be rejected or persecuted for Jesus' sake. It's a shame to be rejected or persecuted because you were a rude jerk. Peter communicated some of this heart in his letter. Let me read you from 1 Peter chapter 4. He says, if you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he is glorified. 
But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or a busybody in other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. Doesn't that put it perfectly? I heard a story, and this is a story from many years ago, but I heard a story about a man who was a Christian, and he got fired from his warehouse job. And they asked him, well, why'd you get fired from your warehouse job? He goes, I got fired because I'm being persecuted for the name of Jesus. You know, here I am just making a stand for Jesus, and they fired me. I go, wow, that's terrible. And somebody dug into the actual circumstances of why he was fired. He worked in a warehouse, and in one part of that warehouse, they had televisions. And he would go up to the cardboard box where the television was, and he would kick it in with his foot and say, tool of the devil, and go around kicking in the picture tubes of the television sets. <laughs> Sir, you didn't get fired for Jesus' sake. You got fired for being an obnoxious jerk, and you should probably be in jail for what you did. Do you see the difference, friends? It's an honor to suffer for being like Jesus. It's a shame to suffer for being a rude jerk. Verse 26, but when the helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. Oh, it's gonna be tough to stand for Jesus in a world that rejects him. But the helper is gonna come and he's gonna help you stand up in those moments. He's going to send the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, the Paraclete. And when he comes, would you please look at that line from verse 26? He will testify of me. What does the Holy Spirit do? He testifies of Jesus. The Holy Spirit doesn't talk much about himself. He loves to point people to Jesus. He will testify of me. And this also shows us that everything that the Holy Spirit does is consistent with the testimony of the nature of Jesus. His job is to tell us and to show us who Jesus is. And friends, if spiritual things happen that are not consistent with the word and the nature of Jesus, you can question whether or not it was the Holy Spirit behind it because he will testify of me, Jesus says. But then he says, verse 27, and you also will bear witness. The disciples were not left alone in the world merely to endure the world's hatred, but no, to be a positive testimony. The Holy Spirit will testify of Jesus, and you disciples will testify of Jesus. Go out and let the Holy Spirit do that work in and through you. Now let's conclude this morning with a look at the first four verses of chapter 16. I, I, I'm, I'm taking these here because they fit in contextually. He says verse 1 of chapter 16. These things I have spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. They will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. And these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things I have told you that when the time comes, you remember that I told you of them. And these things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. Man, when I leave, they're going to put you out of the synagogues. When I leave, you are going to face persecution from the religious establishment just like I faced persecution from the religious establishment. That's what Jesus is telling them. Matter of fact, look at verse 2. The time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. Now, friends, in the 20th century... Most of the persecution that came against believers came from the atheistic communist states. Soviet Russia, communist China, uh, Cambodia, other places in the world. Most of the persecution in the 20th century came from secular atheistic states. But that was different in history. Most persecution against Christians throughout the centuries has come from religious people sometimes by people who claim the name of Jesus. And there have been many, many people who thought they were doing God a favor when they have persecuted or even murdered Christians. Do I need to point it out? Do I need to say what's so obvious? That today thousands of Christians are being killed? 
by Muslims who, if they could, they would slit their throats. And those Muslims are absolutely convinced they are doing a good thing before God when they murder those Christians. Now, Christians aren't the only ones that they're murdering. But we feel a special affinity for our brothers and sisters around the world who are facing such terrible persecution. And even though it does not touch us in the West yet, our hearts go out for it. And we realize that this day is today. It's not only today, it's through history in the past as well, but it is today. Those people who think that God is pleased when they murder other people. But please remember this, and we'll close with this, verse four. When the time comes, you may remember that I told you of them. Jesus wanted to forewarn his disciples because it was going to come as a shock to them. They held a gospel. They delivered a message that was so filled with love, so filled with peace, so filled with goodness for humanity, it would come as a shock to them that it would be so violently rejected. How can you so violently reject a message of love and peace? But Jesus prepared them for it. And we should be prepared. Friends, Jesus is God with us, including God with us in our suffering and rejection. If you suffer in this life, don't let it be wasted, committed unto the Jesus who suffers with you. If you're going to be rejected for being a follower of Jesus, don't let it be wasted. Make sure that you're reflecting his nature and his character. Don't let it be wasted. And Jesus will draw near to you in your suffering and your rejection. Listen, nobody likes feeling rejected. Nobody likes being mocked for being a follower of Jesus. I I've received some of that in my days, haven't you? Haven't you had people laugh at you for being a follower of Jesus? Whenever that happens, I always remember what Charles Spurgeon once said. He said that when people laugh at you for being a follower of Jesus, just remember this, that this world is such a sad place that if you can bring a little more laughter in the world, it's a good thing. <laughs> Why not? But friends, we just remember this. We find a refuge, even in our suffering, even in our rejection, in Jesus himself. But I'll say it one more time and conclude with this. It is an honor to be rejected for Jesus' sake. Let's just make sure that we're not being rejected for being rude, for being jerks. But let's make sure we are truly being rejected for following after our Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, help us with this. We, we look at a world that at least in some ways, Lord, maybe not in every way, but in some ways, it seems to be more and more hostile to you. Jesus, we need you to so fill our life, to so work in us, that if it should be, Lord, that we would be rejected or suffer, that it would really be for Jesus' sake and not because we were evildoers or wrong in any way. Lord, we want it to be true that if anybody has something bad to say about us, they have to lie to say it. Work in our lives to accomplish that, Jesus. There's no way we can accomplish it ourselves. You must work this in us. So we bring ourselves to you. And we ask, Lord, that for those right now who are suffering or feel rejection for the cause of Jesus, that you would draw close to them, especially, Lord, our brothers and sisters in areas of the world where they are paying oftentimes with their lives for being followers of Jesus. We remember those who are in prison. We remember those who are refugees. We remember those who are under all kinds of violence. We remember those, Lord, who die for their faith. Bring strength to your church in Jesus' name.